Today's title is A Good Politician, but that's really the title for uh, the, the morning sermon, but it will still be relevant for this message as well. You and I know this story very well. It is the Old Testament story of Daniel in the lion's den. Honestly, it's not just Christians who know this story. I know plenty of non-Christian friends uh, of my friends who do know this story, even if they've never read the Bible. So I'm sure you've heard of it at least once, or you know this story well. I'm sure you've heard multiple sermons, if you've been going to church all your life, on this very passage, Daniel chapter 6. And here, so, in this chapter, I don't have much more uh, different to add, but if I can share the insights that God has shown me for our congregation here today. Daniel here in Daniel 6 is no longer a young adult. When Daniel first got taken into exile from, in, from his home to Babylon, Daniel was a young man. But here in Daniel chapter 6, after all these kings that he served, Daniel is now 80 years old. That's what the scholars say. He's an old man. But even at that age of 80, you know, a lot of us think, because a lot of us here are very young, including myself, and we all think 80 could 80-year-olds, could, could they even walk? <laughs> right? We might think such ways. Because I remember when I was younger, when my grandfather, who was 80, he seemed really, really old to me. But now, I'm telling you, as I'm getting older, I'm not anywhere near 80, but I'm dealing with brothers and sisters who are 80 in the first service and second service. And they are so healthy. They are so strong. And I'm just so thankful for our brothers and sisters, our, our church members who are still very healthy, even at 80 years old. That's God's blessing. Amen? So even at that age, 80 years old, the king of the Medo-Persian Empire, King Darius, he promotes Daniel. I mean, didn't you retire yet, Daniel? <laughs> right? He promotes Daniel, not only as the top three, because we read that together. But we read again, right? King Darius found more favor in Daniel, not only as the top three officials of the empire, but as we read in verse three, King Darius wants to promote Daniel to oversee the entire kingdom. Yes. In other words, second only to the king himself. That's pretty crazy. And his promotion caused a lot of problems. A lot of problems. It caused a lot of his fellow co well, his colleagues, his co-workers, to feel jealous. They felt envy towards Daniel. Enough so that they wanted, they began to hate Daniel. Hate him. They hated Daniel so much, they wanted him dead. They didn't want to just get rid of Daniel, like throw him off to, uh, put him on an island. No. They didn't want that. They, you're 80 years old. Why don't you retire, Daniel? Not even that. They wanted him dead and buried. That's what they wanted. Buried. And so what did they do? They hired investigators. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but I'm assuming these satraps and these magistrates, these guys are not going to go and look for Daniel, what he does by themselves. So I'm sure they sent some folks, some investigators to look into Daniel's life to find some kind of scandal in his life, to find some corruption, because, hey, every one of us have it, right? We all have some kind of scandal in our lives. But how many did these guys find? They found none. They found zero. And this is very interesting to me, because what we tend to forget about Daniel is that Daniel, for you and I, we think of him as a prophet. We know of him as a prophet. But Daniel, in his days... He was more known to be a politician. That's who Daniel is. He is a dirty, no, he's not a dirty politician, right? He's a good politician, as today's title says, which is an oxymoron, right? Where is a good politician? Where is an honest politician today, right? So Daniel, surprisingly, shocked me too as I was preparing this. I forgot that Daniel's a politician. And in our political world today, as we can try to relate, I mean, I don't know that much about it, but you could clearly see in the news right now, you could see it in the commercials everywhere, 
online social media during this election time, this election year. What do you see? I see it. You'll find a whole lot of people digging into each other's lives. Candidates, they are just they are just going at each other with fake news and some real news, some 20-year-old news, 30-year-old news. They're just digging it up and trying to get at them so they can bring them down, right? That's what they do. Candidates do, do that to each other, right? So it doesn't matter who you are. If people want to find dirt on you, like me, they will, especially with the internet right now and all this information around. It's easy to find <laughs> what's wrong with you. Honestly, even at the church, even at the church, I remember in the previous church where I served that before I came here, I just like how I came here, I wasn't hired because I handed in my resume. And I'm proud of that, to be honest with you. But I didn't have my resume in. I was hired because the senior pastor knew me personally. And so he brought me into the church, uh, my previous church. And so one day, after I was doing ministry there for, I don't know, years and years, I had a chance to share my testimony. But after I shared my testimony before the whole congregation, a couple of the elders who were sitting there, a couple of the elders are sitting there, looked like they'd seen a ghost while I was sharing my testimony. And I, I, and I knew what it was. They were shocked by my testimony. And so when, after I was done, they came up to me, and this is what one of them said. They said, Pastor Daniel, if we knew your testimony beforehand, you wouldn't be here today. That's what they said. If we knew, you wouldn't be here. And they, they're not saying, they didn't say that in a mean way or anything. They were just so shocked about my testimony. I mean, even at our church here at KUC, if I went through, I mean, you can deny this, elders, but even if I, if I went through the formal candidacy process for the senior pastor position, I'm pretty sure I'd be dropped in round one. Why? Because I don't have my, I don't have my PhD, do I? I don't have my doctorate. I did my doctorate. I just don't have the degree. But how many people would apply with a PhD degree? Right there, gone. I probably would have been dropped in round one. They, they deny it right now. <laughs> but only God knows, all right? <laughs> all I can say is this. All of this, my life, and everything that's happened to me is by the grace of God. Amen? Right? That's the same for your life, too. I'm not any more special than you are. Right? Okay, so for Daniel, listen, they couldn't find anything. You'll find a lot of dirt about me. Even if, if you just search my name on Google, Daniel Kwan, you'll find dirt about me. But they couldn't find anything about Daniel. What they could find about Daniel was Daniel's faithful in his work. That's what they found. They found that Daniel was faultless and faultless in his character, right? Daniel was fervent and faithful in his prayer life. That's what they found about Daniel. Now let me ask you personally. Now don't answer this out loud because it's embarrassing. If a private investigator looked into your life, looked into your public life and your private life, past and present, what would they conclude? Right? Is it going to be a clean report? Let me ask you, brothers, if someone decides to take your cell phone away and check everything in there right now, are you comfortable with that? I hope you can say yes. I'm going to state it another way. If you are arrested, if you are arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? For Daniel... The only flaw that he had was that his faith in God. And they knew that because they saw Daniel. They heard Daniel pray every day, three times a day, out loud. He prayed out loud in the same way as the Bible tells us. For how, for, I don't know, for so many years. And so instead of getting him convicted with some existing law in their book of laws, they had to make up a law. They would force him to break that law, and then, of course, he would be executed, right? And so they went to the king. Then they manipulated the king by getting him to pass this law that said, this is the law, for 30 days, 30 days, no one in the Medo-Persian Empire can pray to anybody, any gods, anyone, but to King Darius alone. That's the law. And if you broke that law, 
The punishment is death. You get tossed in to the lion's den. That's funny to me when I read that because basically the law is allowing King Darius to be God. Right? That's what this law is. To be God for 30 days. Darius, you're going to be God for 30 days. I mean, if that was such a good thing for the king, I wonder why he didn't make it forever. Right? I'm just thinking. But for 30 days, if you were a person of prayer, then it was a law that you pray to Darius for 30 days. And the same goes for Daniel as well. Daniel's not an exception. All he had to do, brothers and sisters, was this, not to pray for 30 days. That's all he had to do. How many, how many days have you not prayed for, right? <laughs> like, all he had to do for 30 days is not pray. And he just gets by. And then all he has to do is start up his prayer right after that. Or even this, not just that. If, that, if that's hard to do for Daniel, then Daniel, all you have to do is go into your little room and pray secretly. You don't have to open up the windows and face Jerusalem and pray three times a day out loud. Why would you do that, Daniel? You're dumb. There's more wiser ways to do this. But instead, what happened? When Daniel heard of this edict, this law that was passed, what did Daniel do? Daniel went to pray. That's what Daniel did. Just as he did previously, as the Bible tells us. Or just as he did always, every single day, three times a day. That's Daniel's prayer life. And he did that knowing the consequences. Knowing that he is already being watched. Knowing that people could hear him pray from the outside. He knows that if he gets caught that he's going to die. Yet he's going to continue to pray that way. What interesting, what's interesting to me here is that Daniel's enemies, they were plotting to get Daniel caught right from verse 4 all the way to verse 9. Yeah, verse 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's a lot, right? That's a lot of verses of planning to get Daniel caught. But when Daniel found out this new law that these guys were plotting for verse 4 to verse 4, not verse 4 to verse 9, guess what? Daniel found out verse 10. Just one, not even a full verse. He responds by what? Not with multiple verses. He didn't respond by trying to figure things out and measure things out and calculate everything and try to see if he can, uh, if he can manipulate or somehow scheme his way around it. He wasn't plan planning, planning that. It just says that he went to pray, as he always did. Amen? Isn't that amazing? I mean, when I think about it, it's amazing. Now, I might be taking this too spiritually, but I can't help but see maybe what Daniel saw there. For Daniel... He didn't go to pray to avoid the lion's den. That's not why. He didn't go to pray for a miracle from God. That's not his prayer content. He knew that he's going to get caught. He knew that. And he knew the consequences. Yet he went to pray as he always prayed because for him, he's always been in the lion's den. His bedroom is a lion's den. The upper room where he opened, that's the lion's den for Daniel. In all his past 80 years, I guess, for some odd years of his life, he fought his problems in his lion's den by prayer. And so the real miracle, brothers and sisters, is not that Daniel survived the lions. A lot of people think that's the miracle. No! The real miracle is that he continued to pray even when his life was on the line. He continued to pray even when he knew that he's going to get the lion's den. Now what I see is Daniel. Daniel here is at peace in his prayer. But in contrast, if we take a look at King Darius, and in Daniel chapter 6, if you read it for yourself all throughout that chapter, King Darius, he realized after Daniel was thrown into the pit, he realized what he did. He realized he got tricked. King Darius got tricked. He realized he was manipulated by his own officials. Most importantly, he realized his favorite man, his number two, Daniel, is going to be killed. Yet just as his officials reminded him, hey, king, we can't change the law. The king loved Daniel. He said, hey, king, you can't change that. The Medo-Persian way is you cannot change the law that the king has made. 
So no matter what the king tried to do, he tried to find a loophole in the system, a loophole in the rule, in the law, but no, nothing. It looks like Daniel was going to be condemned to death. And so the king is devastated. The king is so sad. But because of that law, Daniel was brought before the king. And right before he was thrown into the lion's den, listen to what king says to, the, to Daniel in verse 16. This is what he says. He says, and I think this is where it gets good. He says, Daniel, may your God, may your God, who you serve continuously, this is what the king says, may your God, who you serve continuously, deliver you. Now that right there is amazing. And I'll tell you why that's amazing. The king is saying, Daniel, your God will save you. He says, your God will deliver you. But look, I know I'm, I'm king over all of this empire, but I am powerless, Daniel. I am the king of kings of this world. I tried everything, looked for every hole, but there was nothing. There was nothing I could do for you, Daniel. And so I gave up. But Daniel, your God can deliver you. This is coming from a pagan king, an unbeliever. In other words, this is significant. It's, it tells me something very important. What? That Daniel, while he was with the king, while he's living, lived a great testimonial life. He was a great testimony of God to the people around him. This king doesn't know anything about God. How could he? He thinks he's God. He's not a Jew. He's probably never read a word, a single word from the scrolls. He doesn't know anything about this God. But the one thing he knows is Daniel's life. The one thing your coworker knows is your life. And the king proclaims this truth, that Daniel, your God can deliver you, it says. Now, that's not all. I don't know if you noticed this, but the reason why the king can proclaim such claims is because in that same verse, verse 16, the king says, Daniel, may your God whom you serve continuously deliver you. I don't know if you heard that. Continuously. He says continuously. Brothers and sisters, that is what made Daniel's witness, his testimony powerful. Continuously, Daniel consistently served his God. Daniel's service to God wasn't seasonal. He didn't come to church only on Easter and Christmas. Daniel's service is not only on Sundays where he came to church and so now he has to serve God's people. No, it wasn't that at all. For Daniel, he consistently, continuously served God. And here's the punchline. Even though his work was in a secular government job. And I emphasize this because when we think we should continuously serve the Lord, we think that it's only for pastors. When we think about a perpetual job in the church or to God, we think of missionaries. We think that they're the one who needs to do their work continuously. But no, brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter. Me, you, every one of God's children, we continuously serve the Lord in whatever job you are in. Amen? As long as it's not a sinful job. And so that is why, as I've been preaching for the last couple of weeks, that we need to be the salt and the light of the world. As I said earlier, Daniel may, have, may be a prophet to us today, but Daniel wasn't a preacher. He wasn't a priest. Daniel was a politician. And to be a prophet as a politician is an oxymoron. But that is an emphasis for us today that in our profession, in our field of work, and in our family, we can also continuously be a great witness and testimony for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now take a look at what happens next. And we're almost done, but we see in verse 16, a stone is rolled over the entrance. A stone is rolled over. And the entrance not only is rolled over the hole of the den, 
but it's sealed with the signet ring of the king and with the signet of his lords. And when the king went to his palace after he did the sealing, he got rid of all his musicians, he got rid of all the entertainment around him, and he went into his palace, into his room, and he fasted. He had no appetite. He was not only not having any appetite, he couldn't sleep either. Why? Because his favorite guy, Daniel, is in the lion's den. So while Daniel, who is in the lion's den, we don't know what happens in there exactly, but something tells me this, that Daniel had a better time in the lion's den than king in his palace. Daniel was either praying to God, playing with the lions, or just passed out. But from what the Bible tells us, the king was devastated. It looked like the king was in the lion's den. Now look at verse 19 in our chapter of Daniel 6. It says then, at the break of day, or early morning, the king got up, right? He didn't even sleep. And he went in haste to the lion's den. And he cries out to Daniel in hopes that he would be alive, right? He said, hey, Daniel, servant of the living God. That's what he says. Servant of the living God. Has your God, who you serve continually, has he been able to deliver you from the lions? <laughs> right? That's what the king did. And there Daniel responds, and he says for the first time ever in his own book, Daniel chapter 6. He says, oh, king, live forever. My God sent an angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me. Because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. The king was so happy. He took Daniel out of that pit right away. And then right away he threw in the rest, those who plotted against Daniel. And not just them, but their wives and their children. It's really sad. Just threw in all of them. And before, the Bible tells us, they could even hit the floor of the lion's den. The lions devoured them and broke all their bones. That's what it says in the Bible. Now, what I see here is, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. What goes around, comes around. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, right? And that's exactly how our world works even today. Not just back in ancient times. And so if you're guilty, you should be punished, right? And this is what I would call, if you're guilty, you should be punished. I call this the anti-gospel. That's what I call it. Or the antithesis of the gospel. It is exactly the opposite of what Christ did at the cross. What, and what I'm trying to say here is this. A lot of people, when they read the book of Daniel, they read it as if that they are Daniel. I'll read it as if I am Daniel. I am Daniel, but as if I am Daniel in the Bible. And if you've been hearing this sermon carefully from the beginning to the, till now, you will know that I have been intentionally staying away from that, that you are not Daniel. I, I, I didn't make the, any references to that at all. We're not Daniel, guys. We are the instigators. That's who we are. We are the jealous ones. We are those who are envious and murderous people. That's who we are. And so when we read chapter 6 of the book of Daniel, I'm sure we were excited that Daniel made it out alive. That's great. And we're happy to hear that justice had been served. But brothers and sisters, that's supposed to be you and me. We deserve nothing better than the lion's den. We are sinners deserving eternal damnation in hell. But thanks be to God that this story in Daniel chapter 6 isn't a story about justice. But this story, if you really, really hear it carefully, is about a man without any blame. No sin. It's about a man who was faithful to his God, who prayed to his God three times a day. This is a story about a man who prayed faithfully and did everything faithfully, and yet he was sent to die. This is about a man who his enemies were plotting against him and made laws against him. And when he was thrown into a stone room, that will be his tomb. They rolled a stone to seal the opening. 
but with all that was against him. Listen, he could not be touched because the very next early morning, the stone was rolled away and he came out victorious. Whose story is this? It's Jesus' story. Jesus is the one who came up out of the grave and in the midst of this story and in the midst of this antithesis of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus prevails. And, this is, and so we find three things that stand out in our chapter today. Three things. First, we find God's people, Daniel, stand firm in his faith. Second, we find there God protecting his people, Daniel. And third, that testimony of Daniel brings the ungodly king to see the greatness of God. But what's amazing is this story, this three-part point, is not only in Daniel chapter 6. It's also in Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, Daniel and his friends, they stand firm in faith. Remember? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They refuse to eat the king's food. But God, he protects his people. And then what happens? Third, the pagan king acknowledges God. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2 is the same too. Daniel goes and he interprets a dream for the king, but if he interprets it wrong, he's dead. And so God protects his servant, Daniel, and then at the end, third, that king praises God. Chapter 3, guess what? It's the same thing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three friends, they stood up when everybody bowed down, but God protected them, and then at the end, when they came out of the fire, the king praised God. Chapter 4, same thing. Chapter 5, same thing. Chapter 6, same thing. Now, why is this important for us today? Because in the midst of the world that we live today, we are constantly being challenged. We are constantly being challenged to compromise your faith, to break your faith. But if we are faithful, God will protect you. Amen? If you are faithful, if you do not compromise your faith, God will protect you. And not only protect you, he will use your testimony to bring the ungodly, the unbeliever, to praise our Father in heaven. Amen? Isn't that amazing? And so because of that, you and I become witnesses of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so let me say this and end it here. Brothers and sisters, God has called you and me to be the salt and the light of this world. Let us be salt and dissolve right into society and shine the light of Christ that others may see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven. Amen? Let's pray.